but we can't not spend a little time on the second object, which is uh, one of the greatest piece of, pieces of metalwork in the history of art. Uh, that's the wonderful baptistry or basin of St. Louis. And uh, how many of you have seen this in the flesh? It's at the Louvre. But the question is, where in the Louvre is it? Yeah, now we'll, it get, we'll, we'll get to that. Is it I this, big? this big? Great question. You'll probably be able to tell from a, a photo I have later, uh, but it's probably, so the basin part is probably about this wide. Then maybe more like this at the top. So, you know, somebody could carry it and set it down, but it's big enough. You could imagine the hand washing or its use as a baptismal font. It, it's, but it's not huge. Um, it could sit at a grand table, which may have been its function. Um, uh, in fact, it's most likely made uh, for a very different function than how it's used later. It would be a very nice tradition and change object to talk about. So just throwing that out there. Um, but anyway, incredible decoration. So we have an artist, Mohammed Ibn al -Zain. He's so proud of this object, he signed it six times. That's odd. We don't always get one signature in the history of Islamic art uh, on a great work. Sometimes you do six times. Amazing. That should be a signal to us that this is something special. Um, hammered bronze. Bronze is great because it's a little stronger than you know, just copper or something like that, very sturdy. But because of that, not the easiest thing to heat and hammer, to get this wonderful for form, to carve it out, and then you hammer the silver, the gold, and rub that nilo into the surface. Um, everything is heavily worked uh, from its outer surface uh, with engraving, you know, beautiful chasing. Um, and so you have um, incredible detail, both with the inlay form into the bronze and then the detail linear detailing of those surfaces and it's incredible so um, uh, dates to around we think 1320 to 40 or somewhere in there um, uh, uh, it's associated with the Mamluk dynasty this was a dynasty uh, that uh, came to power let's see if I have them on here on um, uh, around 1250. So this is still at the very end of the Abbasid Empire. And here's a regional dynasty that broke off from another Egyptian regional di dynasty. So Baghdad, think about this on the map. Baghdad, not very far to the south, Syria, <laughs> Egypt, they've really lost power in Baghdad because this is not the first competing kingdom in that area. So they're really weakening at this point, and they'll get wiped out in a couple years by the Mongols. But the Mamluks start around 1250, and they find a way to survive in some form or another uh, into um, the 16th century. Um, but this is a great period for them because they've inherited some already great metalwork, glasswork, some of these incredible decorative arts that were developed in this region, you know, from Syria um, down into Egypt. Uh, and so we see this kind of culmination of this type of workmanship in this early Mamluk period. Um, so I'm just going to tell you, and then I'll will kind of try to show you to convince you that this was not made for the French royalty and was not made for probably even the European market, although a lot of pieces were from uh, the Mamluk period and before. Um, but this was probably made for the Mamluk ruler or a very high-ranking noble, 
associated, closely associated with the center of the court. Um, it was probably a hand washing basin or used in banqueting in some way. And then we don't know when it went to France. The first record, written records that we can confirm are talking about this basin are in the 18th century, uh, and it was in the treasury of Saint-Chapelle, and it was used for baptism of children in the royal family. And there were some additions in the 19th century, some French blazons and things that were applied to it, and they kind of weld it on, and they kind of integrate with things that were already on the basin. So you have to look at it very carefully, um, but most of the decoration, or most of everything, is this uh, 13th century form. But that's where it gets interesting. So this may um, date earlier as a French liturgical object, but we know it's at least by the 18th century it's there. And um, Saint Louis, I think, is like 10th or 11th century in France or something. So the name is wrong. It has always been known as this. This was Saint Louis's basin, but Saint Louis would have dated you know, the King Louis would have dated a couple hundred years before it was made. So we know that's wrong. Because all the kids are going to make that leap. I wouldn't blame them, but all right. So detail and super detail. Um, let's look at the decoration, because it's very interesting. So in two-tone, gold and silver, uh, you have very detailed uh, kind of uh, imagery on the inside and the outside. So most of what I have details of are the outside, unfortunately. But the outside has four rondelles, kind of 90 degrees apart, each featuring a noble. Um, I think all of them might be mounted, but I'm not sure the memory serves me right. Uh, doing something that nobles do. So here he is, you know, brave uh, uh, kind of noble warrior on a horse slaying an animal, a bear, or uh, something like that. And they're flanked by attendants who seem to be attending them on either sides until you get to the next scene. So there seem to be figures of great importance in the rondels and then maybe high-ranking courtiers around them. So let's talk about who they might be. Um, some art, art historians have come right out and said that um, on the outside, two of these rondels definitely depict Mamluk emirs, meaning kind of high-ranking advisors, local, maybe local governors um, uh, of the sultan, of the Mamluk sultan's inner circle. And I'll show you who uh, some of the, the, them are. Um, we think we have some idea, perhaps, of who these figures are. Just to the left, your left, of, of that rondel. Um, they're wearing court dress, what is often called the Central Asian or the Tartar style, uh, which would have become kind of popular through uh, this kind of uh, Central Asian uh, movement of, of peoples, like the little boots. Um, they're wearing armor, which is re recognizable as appropriate for the time. And there are things about them. They're wearing turbans, which match what you would expect from Mamluk courtiers based upon other decorative arts uh, we have. And they even have things like blazons, insignia, on different parts of their garments. Here on the boots, here. Each one's different. Well, historians know what that insignia is. That is um, the Emir Salar, the viceroy to Egypt. So he was the governor that the Sultan placed to rule Egypt. We know who this is. We don't know his name, but look, he's carrying this bundle on his shoulders. He's beautifully dressed, and he's got this cloth draping over his arm. That's one of the cabinet members in the court. He's the master of the wardrobe. 
and that cloth symbolizes that. And then you get to these things in this register here. And a few things have been applied later, but this is what throws everybody. What's that look like? Florida Lee. Florida Lee. What the heck is that doing? It's clearly made for the French king. Well, guess what? The symbol of this branch of the Mamluk family is the lily. That's their emblem. It just happens that it looks like the Florida de Lee. So it's this wonderful, great historical um, uh, kind of fun uh, thing. And I just wanted to compare it to another Mamluk object, a decorative art. So you see this type of imagery with dense decoration, maybe vegetal kind of scrolling dense decoration, and then figural images of nobles hunting or fighting or doing something is right out of the common kind of visual culture of the Mamluk period. So these are beautiful um, Mamluk glass, which is the other great art form uh, from this period. And you can see very similar types of figures, some of them wearing the same types of um, turbans, others wearing different hats. These might help us identify who they are, or what culture or kingdom they represent. I'm sorry, because I don't know where Mamluk. I don't know where they're from. Okay, and you know what? When you Google Mamluk, it's it's going to be a little bit of a problem too, because there are different dynasties across the Islamic world called Mamluk at different times, because Mamluk, as a term, means slave. So what? slave. And so it's often called, like in India, there's a Mamluk dynasty, the slave dynasty, the first Delhi Sultanate. So it's a little bit of a problem, but I'll tell you where these guys come from. Um, they uh, were um, uh, slaves, essentially um, army soldiers for hire, mercenaries who served uh, the previous dynasty, which I think would have been the Ayyubids uh, in this region. And some of them rose to the rank of general and became powerful. And the first Mamluk ruler to kind of, uh, kind of have a coup, if you will, and overthrow uh, the previous dynasty and establish a new dynasty was a high-ranking general. But they considered themselves slaves. They are servants, too. They weren't nobles by birth. They weren't from noble cat, uh, classes. Uh, they were soldiers. And that general married a high-ranking noble woman. And so that, the two of them together then established a dynasty. So he uh, married up and formed a kingdom. But the Mamluks of Egypt, which is this, 1250 to around 15-something, um, controlled... Uh, parts of you know, Syria, Jordan, that little kind of western bit of um, the Near East uh, and Egypt. Now here's the inside. And it gets better for rondels on the inside. Two of these depict enthroned rulers. Again, we're not sure who. We don't know which Mamluk Sultan, but it's got to be because of the way they're depicted. It's how you would depict um, the dynastic ruler. And in the bottom of the basin, these wonderful engraved images uh, with silver inlaying. You see a lot of the silver is missing because the thing was probably used a lot, the water in the basin. And some of that silver is lifted out. But see how we have swirling fish in the center, almost like a sunburst or a starburst. And in Islamic metalwork, in particular, you see, um, you see it in ser painted ceramics, too. But in the bottom of a bowl, particularly one maybe used for religious purposes, you'll see fish and a sunburst. It gives you the impression that you're looking at water on the earth and the sun reflected in it. And it's kind of bringing this divine kind of light and the earth together in the water perfect symbolism for a baptismal font. For a what? 
for a baptismal font, how it was used later. But we see it in secular objects as well. The motif of rings of fish in the bottom of a bowl that held water and a radiant kind of circular center, perhaps representing the sun. It looks like it. I think some of these might be like water snakes, and then some of these are the tails of the uh, of fish. Surfing, but over one more. Yeah. It looks like yeah, I think you are. Yeah, I think they're crocodiles and stuff in, in the bottom, too. Okay, so the baptistry, and I'll just jump to my notes here. I mean, how much metalwork is on that list of 250? That alone is reason. That, that you tell your kids, metal work, not just a metal sculpture, but metal work, one of the world's most important. For that reason alone, one of the greatest. That deserves to be taught in this course. And then if you can get details, tell them a little bit about the imagery, oh, they're going to love it. And be sure to tell them it probably wasn't made for King Louis because he lived like 300 years before it was made. <laughs> But anyway, um, I thought maybe it could relate to the Pyxis most closely, in, you know, as an Islamic object with dense, you know, a container uh, with dense imagery that's political. Um, but I, uh, I just, I thought, well, what on earth has kind of nobility or political imagery? So that's how I came up with these suggestions. You might have some others. What might you compare it to? in your course. 